It's good to be connected to each and every one of you as we come together for our worship service this evening. I do have some announcements I need to share with you. Uh, first of all, that we are within about $140 of achieving our Lottie Moon Christmas offering goal. Our goal as a church was or is $4,000. So uh, we are within about $140 of reaching that. And just want to encourage you that if you have not had an opportunity to participate and would yet like to, you have the time and opportunity to do so tonight. I want to share just a very quick little gem about Lottie Moon. Uh, throughout the 175-year history, Southern Baptists have maintained an uninterrupted witness among the nations in spite of famine, war, civil unrest. This commitment has not come without sacrifice. Sixty missionaries and children have died because of tragic circumstances while serving with the International Mission Board, that is IMB, since the organization's founding in 1845 when it was known as the Foreign Mission Board. The causes include accidents such as drowning, automobile and air crashes, ships lost at sea. They include deaths as the result of war and criminal or terrorist activity. In some cases, the missionaries were targeted specifically because of their faith or their missionary service. Of those 60, more than 20 International Mission Board missionaries lost their lives as a result of human hostility in a cross-cultural setting, according to Scott Peterson of the, MI, of the IMB Global Research Team. While the IMB does not typically refer or describe personnel who died in active service as martyrs, the sacrifice of those who died while serving cross-culturally is no less significant than those who were targeted specifically for their faith. Each life given is a sacrifice because of a life lived in obedience to Jesus Christ. So when you give to the Lottie Moon Christmas offering, you are honoring the sacrifices of those 60 over that 175-year period of time, honoring the sacrifices of those who are serving as boots on the ground, so to speak, even tonight. It's not about dollars and cents. It is about touching lives for eternity. I also uh, would like to uh, give you a informational uh, moment here before we enter into a time of worship. Lord willing, we will reopen this coming Sunday morning. Sunday morning worship service uh, that morning will be at 11 o'clock. No Sunday school services will be provided at that time. Then Sunday night, that is on the 17th, next Sunday, we will have worship service at 6.30. The reason for that time is this. We are not going to be having discipleship training meeting. Uh, for right now, COVID cases are still too high uh, for I th to feel comfortable having up close and personal type Sunday school classes and discipleship training classes. So to err on the side of caution, an abundance of caution, we are not having that. But we will have on-site worship service Sunday night, then at 6.30 p.m. Now, first of all, number one, if you are high risk, then let me strongly urge you to remain at home. Uh, and if you're able to watch us on Facebook or on YouTube, then by all means, avail yourself of that. Uh, if you are high risk in, 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 in your health, I, I certainly would strongly urge you to, to do that. Number two, if you feel unsure or if you feel uncertain about coming back uh, on-site worship services as we are still dealing with a pandemic and it is still a very real reality, uh, a painful reality for many even at this, at this present moment, that I would encourage you to stay home. It's okay. It's not a case that you're sitting home wanting to watch a ball game. I get that. Uh, I, you have to do what you feel led is, is best for yourself and for your family. Number three, I would strongly urge you, strongly urge you, wear your mask. Uh, we are dealing with a COVID variant, a COVID-19B, uh, so to speak, variant, that while the symptoms may not be any worse than the main uh, pestilence, it is uh, still aggressive in terms of being contagious. So I would strongly urge you to wear your mask. I, I hate to sound emphatic upon that, but I just am putting it out there, and I trust that you would use uh, God-given common sense on that. But we will open, Lord willing, uh, next Sunday morning at 11, and then uh, we'll also be open that Sunday night at 6.30.
And as I'm remembering it, Sunday night will be the business meeting after the worship service. So we, um, we still have a, a, a new year to have to plan, and we, we still have to move forward. Uh, I would ask as a church family, be in prayer uh, for our church as well as our sister churches. Uh, these are difficult times to navigate, to walk by faith and to use God-given common sense. Pray that God would indeed put a hedge of protection uh, as we seek to be obedient. And I will say this as your pastor, we will do what we have to do. Uh, first, obviously, to obey God and to make sure that everybody remains safe. So we may have to stop and start a few times uh, just because there's a vaccine that's available. We are not at the end of the ro roller coaster ride yet, and there may still be a few there may still be a few mind bender uh, loops that we may have to hit before now and, and spring gets here or before now and the summer gets here. So I ask that you just be patient as we work together and as we walk together and as we worship together, but we will come through this together. Now that's the end of my infomercial, but I wanted to share that with you as I had it on my heart and mind this evening. I call us now to a time of prayer as we enter into a time of worship. And for all who are watching by Facebook and by YouTube, welcome to the worship services of Chunky Baptist Church. Let us pray. Gracious Father God, we thank you. We thank you, God, that you have brought us to this point. Father, we ask you for your grace, your mercy. Father, for your protection as we seek to, to come back. Father, that we would do so wisely. Father, that none would come that would feel pressured in any shape, way, form, or fashion. Lord, come as you would lead them. And Lord, those who don't need to come because of health concerns, Father, I pray that you would give them that peace, Lord, of mind about that as well. Lord, help us to be on mission with you. We thank you, Father God, for the word that you give us. And I ask that you would help us to apply that in our daily life. It is in Jesus' name I pray and ask. Amen.
years I spent in vanity and a pride, caring not my Lord was crucified, caring not for it was for me he died on Calvary. Mercy there was great and grace was free, pardon there was multiplied to me. There my burdened soul found liberty at Calvary. By God's word at last my sin I learned, then I trembled at the law I'd spurned. Till my guilty soul imploring turn to Calvary. Mercy there was great and grace was free. Pardon there was multiplied to me. There my burdened soul found liberty at Calvary. Now I've given to Jesus everything. Now I gladly own him as my king. Now my raptured soul can only sing of Calvary. Mercy there was great and grace was free. Pardon there was multiplied to me. There my burdened soul found liberty at Calvary. Oh, the love that drew salvation's plan. Oh, the grace that brought it down to man. Oh, the mighty gulf that God did span at Calvary. Mercy there was great and grace was free. Pardon there was multiplied to me. There my burdened soul found liberty at Calvary. If you have your Bibles, turn with me to the book of Joshua, chapter 9. We'll be looking at verses roughly 1 through 27. Joshua chapter 29, as we continue in our series of the crossover to conquest. In the book of the Old Testament, Joshua. And we will be turning there. Joshua is in the Old Testament. I know where it is, and I just found it. Beginning with chapter 9, verse 1 and following. And it came to pass when all the kings which were on this side... Jordan, that is the Jordan River, in the hills and in the valleys, and in all the coast of the great sea over against Lebanon, the Hittites and the Amorite, the Canaanite, the Perizzite, the Hivite, and the Jebusite heard thereof, that they gathered themselves together to fight with Joshua and with Israel with one accord. And when the inhabitants of Gibeon heard what Joshua had done unto Jericho and to Ai, they did work wilily, that is, deceitfully, and went and made as if they had been ambassadors, and took old sacks upon their donkeys and wine bottles, old and rent and bound up, and old shoes and clouded upon their feet, and old garments upon them. And all the bread of their provision was dry and moldy, some translations say dry and crumbly. And they went to Joshua unto the camp at Gilgal, and said unto him, and to the men of Israel, We be come from a far country. Now therefore make ye a league with us. In other words, we're from a far country. Make a treaty of peace with us. And the men of Israel said unto the Hivites, Peradventure ye dwell among us, and how shall we make a league with you? And they said unto Joshua, We are thy servants. And Joshua said unto them, Who are ye, and whence come ye? And they said unto him, From a very far country, thy servants are come because of the name of the Lord thy God, for we have heard the fame of him and all that he did in Egypt, 
And all that he did to the two kings of the Amorites that were beyond Jordan, to Sihon, king of Heshbon, and to Og, king of Bashan, which was at Ashtaroth. Wherefore our elders and all the inhabitants of our country spake to us, saying, Take victuals, that is, take food, for with you for the journey. And go to meet them, and say unto them, We are your servants, therefore now make ye a league with us. This is our bread. We took hot for our provision out of our houses on the day we came forth to go unto you. But now, behold, it is dry, and it is moldy. And these bottles of wine which we, we filled were new, and behold, they be rent. These are garments, and our shoes are become old by reason of the very long journey. And the men took of their victuals and asked not counsel at the mouth of the Lord. And Joshua made peace with them and made a league with them to let them live. And the prince of the congregation swore unto them, that is the leaders of the Israelite congregation swore unto them. And it came to pass at the end of three days after they had made a league with them that they heard that they were their neighbors and that they dwelt among them. And the children of Israel journeyed and came unto their cities on the third day. Now their cities were Gibeon and Kephira and Beroth and Kirjath Jerim. And the children of Israel smote them not, because the prince or princess of the congregation had sworn unto them by the Lord God of Israel. And all the congregation murmured against the princes, in other words, the leaders of Israel. But all the princes said unto all the congregation, We have sworn unto them by the Lord God of Israel. Now therefore we may not touch them. This we will do to them. We will even let them live, lest wrath be upon us, because of the oath which we swore unto them. And the princes said unto them, Let them live, but let them be hewers of wood and drawers of water unto all the congregation, as the princes had promised. And Joshua called for them, and he spake unto them, saying, Wherefore have ye beguiled us, saying, We are very far from you, when ye dwell among us? Now therefore ye are cursed, and there shall be none of you be freed from being bondmen and hewers of wood and drawers of water for the house of my God. And they answered Joshua and said, because it was certainly told thy servants how that the Lord thy God commanded his servant Moses to give you all the land and to destroy all the inhabitants of the land from before you. Therefore we were sore afraid of our lives because of you and have done this thing. And now, behold, we are in thine hand. As it seemeth good and right unto thee to do unto us, do. And so he did unto them. And delivered them out of the hand of the children of Israel, and they slew them not. And Joshua made them that day hewers of wood and drawers of water for the congregation. And for the altar of the Lord, even unto this day, in the place which he should choose. May God bless the reading of his word. Discernment versus disaster. Discernment serves you better than just common sense alone. It was true in Joshua's day. It's true in our day. Now, I'm not saying we don't need common sense. Please don't let that be the takeaway. We need common sense. You can have too much book learning and not, not a bit of common sense. You need common sense, but it needs to be a sanctified common sense, a, a, a common sense that comes from discerning the word and the will of God. Discernment versus disaster. The horrors of war are accentuated in the use of deception. In World War II, one of the German army tactics, and specifically that of the Nazis, was to switch the road signs so that allied forces on the ground coming into an area could not depend on the road signs road signs for direction because generally with the road signs being switched unless they had been changed back and you never knew if they had or not you might be going in the wrong way it was a way to misdirect it was meant to ensure confusion and chaos and slow down the allied advance therefore the allies had to rely on their own maps 
and to discern how to read the map correctly to know where to go and how to get there. In the Old Testament, in the conquest of Canaan, now Joshua and the people are going to experience a different type of scenario. Now they're going to experience a different type of warfare, not a, not a head-on confrontation where they're marching around Jericho or the Ai situation, the first battle of Ai being, of course, a disaster because they really did not seek God. This time it's going to involve deception, not the battle of Ai. The second battle of Ai was a God-given route. Uh, God gave them the victory using, uh, using an ambush, so to speak, to achieve victory and annihilate the enemy because God was using Israel. I know it sounds violent and bloody. The Old Testament really is not. But God was using Israel to bring judgment against those nations that had utterly refused him time and time again. This time, they're experiencing a different form of warfare, the art of warfare that involves outright deception. The Gibeonites were discerning, and they used their discernment to practice a desperate deception, a gambit that paid off because the Israelites were undiscerning of God. But God, by His grace, repurposed the decision and the outcome. Israel would not be derailed by this unwise decision. Because we find in the midst of that a merciful God, not just on behalf of Israel, but yes, even on behalf of the Hivites of Gibeon, or we will call them the Gibeonites. Today, as you and I continue our own crossover to conquest, where we have stopped and starts, we've had a pause. We hope to come back uh, on site next Sunday. There may yet be pauses ahead of us. We too need a healthy, holy sense of discernment. And as pastor, I need that most definitely. So I covet your prayers. Discernment allows us to detect and deter deceptive errors that we face all around us. As we look at the passage, and I've read a big part of it tonight, I'm going to read some of it in the New King James. There is a sense of desperation, and that is on the part of the Gibeonites. In Joshua chapter 9, 1 and 4, it came to pass when all the kings, they heard that Israel is there, and they know what happened at Jericho, they know what happened at Ai, that they gathered to fight Israel as one. It says, but when the inhabitants of Gibeon heard what Joshua had done to Jericho and Ai, or Ai, that they worked craftily or deceitfully. Joshua 9, 24. So they answered Joshua and said, because your servants were clearly told that the Lord your God commanded his servant Moses to give you all the land and to destroy all the inhabitants of the land from before you, therefore we were very much afraid for our lives because of you and have done this thing. So there is a sense of, on the part of the Gibeonites, a desperate discernment. The Gibeonites had heard of the report and of the reputation of Israel and specifically of what God had told Moses and obviously of the, of the military reputation of Joshua. They, that is Israel, and their God were and are a force to be reckoned with. Israel's presence was not merely a military operation, but it was an act of divine judgment upon the collective sin of a collective people group. So Gibeon had every reason and had every right to be afraid for their very lives. And so they approached it in the best way they knew how. Even much like Rahab, who had heard of the report, and she had faith in Jehovah God and was willing to help the spies at Jericho. Similar situation, but from a different point of view. They knew it was a take-no-prisoners approach. And unlike their fellow denizens of Canaan, who were angry and allied, thinking we're going to push them back to the Jordan River, we're going to drown them in their own blood, the Gibeonites were afraid. And sometimes, 
perhaps it is the fear of God that is the beginning of true wisdom, is it not? We can have all sorts of, of ideas, and we can have all sorts of knowledge and experience, but there needs to be a holy, healthy fear of God. Now, we know fear of God, rever it, it means reverence and respect. I would also say, in that literal sense, there is a, a, there is a point there. A fear of God is the beginning of knowledge and wisdom. So from the Gibeonites' point of view, it's every man for himself. Kind of the ends justify the means of fight for the survival. The Bible teaches, or rather Bible teachers would tell us, that the story of Gibeon shows one way in which unified opposition against Israel failed. Gibeon heard of an alliance. Gibeon, I'm sorry, the head of an alliance of four Hivite cities, they preferred something other than fighting and dying. They preferred peace. So it was a desperate discernment. The Bible says in Joshua 6, 27, So the Lord was with Joshua, and his fame spread throughout the land. So this is confirmation that that is so. Dr. Donald Madvig, a Bible expert and teacher, says, and I quote, the Gibeonites were drawn by the great fame or name of Yahweh, that is Jehovah, and were spared when they said, we have heard reports of him. They indicated that God's mighty acts on behalf of Israel had made his great name known far and wide. They believed, like Rahab, the reports about the God of Israel, and fear drove them, like her, to seek his protection and to scheme to escape annihilation. Dr. Ken Gangle, who is another Bible teacher, says it this way. This is the first mention of Gibeon in the Bible, though it later became a Levitical city. Its primary importance is right here because of the desperate discernment that they were realizing, we are going to die, and we don't want to die. We will do whatever it takes to survive. And we're also reminded by way of application that God is not willing that any should have to perish. Rather, he would rather the wicked come to their senses and repent, changing their attitude, changing their actions, agreeing with him and returning to him, and he will have mercy. The Old Testament is as full of grace as the New Testament also has law. It's not law on one side and grace on the other. There's as much grace in the Old Testament as there is law in the New Testament and vice versa. So they came to a desperate decision. The Gibeonites would seek to entreat Joshua and the army. They sent emissaries or ambassadors, messengers, and they are going to appeal for mercy. They're just going to leave out one important detail. We're your next door neighbors. They make it look as if they have traveled from a far and distant country. That they had heard of the fame of Jehovah God and of Moses and, and Joshua. So they're coming so that they can get in on the good side now. They leave out the fact that they're actually next door neighbors. Like the Gibeonites, we too, you and I tonight, we know of the Lord. We know of his great reputation and of his great record. Does it move you and me to act in 2021? Does it call us to be serious about him, about ourselves and about others in his name? May we have in this year of 2021 an acute sense of, of our own situational awareness. And may it make us desperate for the Lord's presence, desperate for the Lord's provision, and desperate for the Lord's protection. But, unlike the Gibeonites, you and I do not have to resort ever to carnal means before God. So we look at the deception that they pretended to be ambassadors. I'm not going to read the entire passage again, but I would refer you to Joshua chapter 9, verses 4 through 8. 
And it is what I call an abject deception. It's not just a little bit. It's a whopper. The Gibeonites pretended, they pretended to be a people uh, coming from a distance who simply desired peace that they were not troublemakers. Well, no, they weren't troublemakers. Some Bible scholars teach that they were probably uh, big into the winemaking aspect of that region. And so, no, they didn't want to lose their profit. They didn't want to lose their lives. They didn't want to lose their livelihood. And so, hey, let's make peace. Let's don't have war. So it is an abject deception that they go to. It's elaborately designed to give the appearance that they are legitimate, that they're even pitiable. In reality, they were neighbors, and they're lying through their teeth. Their method, obviously, is not good. Their motive was, because we don't want to die. But it was also an audacious deception. It is, it's, I believe it's simplicity is audacious. And the sincerity that they presented to Joshua and to the elders of Israel and to the congregation, the assembly of the people at Gilgal. Now, it may be that Gilgal is that same original campsite and shrine that they were living at when they first crossed over. But keep in mind, in Old Testament, there are many locations that would bear the name Gilgal uh, for various reasons. Uh, and such, it may be uh, a different location. They're using the same name. Uh, it, it happens. Sometimes it's confusing when you try to have studied uh, biblical archaeology and biblical geography and try to find where's where because you have the same names, different locations. There's a Canton, Mississippi. There's a Canton, Texas. There's a Canton, Ohio, if I'm not mistaken. And then there's a Canton, China. It's all the same name. It's just different locations. It can be a little confusing at times. But it's simple, sincere. It is audacious, and the Gibeonites built it for all its worth. Oh, they were good. I've seen people lay it on before. I've had students try to convince me why we should not have a test, or why I should not grade a test very hard, or why I should not grade that particular student's test very hard. Oh, I mean, just give me the sob story. I mean, you know, just, just pour it out there. Uh, I, one time, of course, back in my day, back in the day, it used to be when you were hearing one of those stories, you did the fiddle thing, as in, please, sing me a sad story. Nowadays, it would have been, um, do the little part with your finger as if it's a CD player, but now that's even gone the way of the dodo. So nowadays, it's just put the ear pod in the ear and sing me a sad story. Oh, I have heard some, some really, uh, just lay it on thick. They knew in my class, Hey, let's get Brother Moore talking about Star Wars. That'll, 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 that'll change the subject. I threw him a curveball one time. Some of their extra credit. I can't talk tonight. Let's try that again, shall we? Some of their extra credit came from that little brief discussion they brought up on Star Wars. I said, hey, it's fair game. If I open my mouth, you're responsible for it. But yeah, they were laying it on thick. The Gibeonites laid it on thick. They looked legit. They sounded legit. They even made a confession from a very far country. Your servants have come because of the name of the Lord Jehovah your God, for we have heard of his fame. That much was true. It wasn't a total lie. There was nuggets of truth wrapped in that deception. They were redirecting Joshua's attention. And they redirected it back to the, look at how we are dressed, man. We had new clothes on, and look at us. We're just ragged. New shoes, they're worn out. Our bread is, is old, crumbly, and musty. Oh, like I said, they were good. They were good. I would have you note that it's an alarming deception. Joshua and the elders chose to accommodate the request. They did not practice discernment. They did practice their common sense. They relied on their experience, their knowledge. It looked legit. It sounded logical. Maybe there's some of that element of lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. Not so much the lust of the flesh, but maybe there's some lust of the eye and pride of life going on. Now, that's just an implication. I'm not going to say, thus saith the Lord on that, but it's certainly pride of life on, on their aspect of it. 
The Bible tells us in the book of Proverbs that we are not to lean on our own understanding. But in everything, in every way, we commit our ways and seek God's way. Commit our ways to Him and seek God's way. And He shall direct your paths. They probably thought it's not a bad idea for allies. Think about it. Even now, Israel, modern nation of Israel, is, is a democracy surrounded by a, a sea of hostility of various nations that would have a vested interest in seeing Israel destroyed, overrun, or overcome. So Israel desires to have good and trustworthy and strong allies. Back in the day, in the Old Testament period, here is Joshua and the army of Israel in a sea of hostility. They're thinking, hey, we get some allies. It's not bad to have friends. Again, very logical. They assumed, and you should never assume. Here's the alarming issue. In Joshua 9, verse 14, Then the men of Israel took some of their provisions, but they did not ask counsel of the Lord. Israel could not take advantage of wisdom and discernment that they did not seek or that they did not ask for. Dr. Ken Gangle states, Missing God's will by making an honest but significant mistake, they were fooled by their enemies and had to live with the consequences. Trying to walk by sight, the Israelites failed to walk by faith. Ouch. Because that's true for you and me. That's true for the church in the 21st century. Sometimes it's not a case that we deviate because, hey, I'm just going to jump off and, and do my own thing here. That's not always the case. Sometimes it, it's a choice. It's not always a choice between good and evil. Those tend to be the easy choices. It may be a choice between what is, what is good and what is godly. Go with what is godly. It may be a choice between what is right and what is righteous. And then where there is spiritual deception is, is concerned because we are no different and we're no better than our first parents, meaning Adam and Eve, that we too are subject to mind games by Satan. Where that lust of the flesh and the lust of the eyes and the pride of life uh, come into play, we better be prayed up because sometimes it looks good. Sometimes it sounds good. It, uh, it's logical, and everything just seems to click. Used to be a saying in my class, if it walks like a duck, if it quacks like a duck, if it looks like a duck, it must be a chicken. Seriously, that was the saying. I bet you're at home scratching your head saying, what? In other words, appearances, literally, in this case of the Gibeonites, are deceptive. As we move into 2021 and our crossover, we will fail. We will fail if we fail to take all issues and decisions to the Lord, seeking His counsel. We do this by prayer. We do this by getting into His Word, by seeking that godly counsel, even going to others that we, we know are godly men and women who spend time with the Lord asking their advice, asking their opinion, but always seeking first the kingdom of God and His righteousness. We will fail if we fail to discern. We discern by depending on the Holy Spirit to reveal to us. And here's the good news, friends. He can he will. We will fail if we do not stay on target with what He has already shown to us. If we depend only on our knowledge and experience and we don't seek first the counsel of God, we will fail. Pure and simple and plain as it is. Next time we gather together, we'll look at this continuing aspect of the crossover as the discovery is going to be made and, and everything that is involved about that discovery, the consequences. 
when it dawned on the Israelites, oh, we done made a mistake and we can't erase it. And then how God can take those choices of consequence and he can repurpose them. But tonight, as we think about the Gibeonites, we are reminded that God is a merciful, gracious God. And thus, he was willing to allow them to live, honoring the commitment that Joshua had made, even without his counsel, and, and the Israelites would live with that. But the Gibeonites would have opportunity to be exposed to the word of God. Faith cometh by hearing. Hearing by the word of God. Perhaps tonight, like the Gibeonites, you are hearing not my sermon, you're hearing perhaps the word of God. Maybe the Holy Spirit is putting it upon your heart that tonight is the night that you need to make a decision for Jesus Christ. That tonight is the time that you've heard of God and what he has done in Scripture. Perhaps you are aware of, of things that God has done or, or allowed in your life or around your life, but for whatever reason you've held back or, or for whatever reason you just haven't made that choice. I urge you, be like the Gibeonites in a good sense, that hearing of God's record and of his great name, let it spur you to action to say, Lord Jesus, I am a sinner. I am just like the Gibeonites, and I don't want to die. And I certainly don't want to spend an eternity separated from you. Jesus, you died on the cross. You paid the price for my sin. You rose from the grave. I believe with my head. I trust you with my heart. Be my Lord and Savior, and I thank you for doing that. If that is your prayer or something like that, it may just be something simple. Jesus, save me. If that's your prayer, and you mean business, Jesus means business with you. And I would invite you to make that decision known. Let us know here at Chunky Baptist Church where we would be glad to come alongside you, walk with you, talk with you, pray with you, share with you, lead you in believer's baptism, which is a way of saying you are unafraid and unashamed to claim the name. And it may be a different decision that God is putting on your heart tonight. It may be that as you go into 2021, maybe you have a feel. oh, I've got a good grip on this. Uh, 2020 is behind us, and, and we're ready to, to ride on into 21. Second start of the right, straight on to the morning. We're ready to roll. Hoo-yah, we got this. May I caution you, before you move forward, seek God's counsel. In all your ways, acknowledge Him. Let Him direct your paths. If that's your prayer and you mean business, He will. Let's bow for a word of prayer. We are dismissed. Gracious Father God, thank you, Lord, that you give us the ability through your Holy Spirit and your, your precious written word to be able to discern. I ask that you would indeed sanctify our experience, our knowledge, our common sense, all that, uh, the wisdom and, and logic that we have, the reason, all these things, intellect, Father, that you have given us. Lord, we ask that you would consecrate it and use it so that we might be able to discern Father, as we move into the remainder of this month, as we move into the remainder, Lord, of, of this, uh, this post-holiday season, looking at the coming of this new year, Lord, may we have discernment. Lord, help us to bring everything to you before we try to do anything. Father, give your word success tonight. Father, call us to your word, your worship, and your work. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. By His grace, go with God.